how's about we begin officially, gang? Uh, my name is Eddie Gordon, courseware designer at Pragmatic Institute, and it is so good to have you on our uh, webinar and podcast series again today. Uh, you may have seen some of my work uh, in coursewares designed in uh, the Pragmatic Alumni community. That is the slide that is up on your screen right now. If you are not a member of the Pragmatic Alumni community, you are missing out. That is the place to go for communication about our industry, the product industry. You will find so many resources in there. You will find people in there that you can ask questions of and learn from. You will find opportunities to teach other people. That is the cool thing about a community. And you will find so many documents and resources that uh, will help you out to better your career. So if you are not yet a member of the Pragmatic Alumni Community, it's because you haven't taken a Pragmatic course yet. Everybody takes a Pragmatic Institute course, you're a member of the community. So go do that today if you've not done it yet. Such a cool resource for you. And with that, next slide, please, Alex. Today, we are talking about ways that we can leverage our marketing plans and strategies to identify growth opportunities within our various markets. Uh, and, and before you ask, yes, everyone will get a recording. Everybody who's registered for the webinar today will get a recording of the presentation today. So you'll get to watch it at your leisure. Uh, put your pencils down, no need to take notes. You can watch it again later. And with that, I have the great pleasure of introducing our guest for today, Alex Rainford. Alex, how are you? I am great. Thank you very much. Coming to you from sunny Florida right now. Sunny, humid Florida. No hurricanes today? Nope. That was a year ago today. So we are, we're in good shape so far. Good, good. Alex, I have a, a bio here to introduce you to the folks. Are you ready to be embarrassed? I am ready. Give me what you got. Alex is a results-driven product marketer with experience in both B2B and B2C marketing, specifically when it comes to developing and crafting go-to-market strategy, positioning, messaging, and beyond. Alex has a passion for working across channels to breed advocacy and sales enablement while helping to collaborate and build a deeper understanding of the needs of the market. Currently, he's with HubSpot. Is that correct, Alex? That is correct. Welcome. It is so good to have you. Are you ready to uh, make us all smarter on these topics? I will try my best. That was a great introduction. Hard to live up to that, but I'm excited to get started. <laughs> Take it away. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. For that great intro, Eddie, uh, I'm really excited to be speaking here today with the Pragmatic Institute. Uh, here's a nice photo of me uh, and my wife, Kelly, and our baby. So always love to throw that in just to prove I'm sleep deprived and still doing this. As Eddie mentioned, I work at HubSpot, an amazing company, by the way, and previously did a lot of work at Cengage Group, along with a little bit of time in commercial insurance. So I am usually in Cincinnati, but I am doing this call from sunny Fort Myers, Florida, where I recently moved from. All right, today I have a pretty action-packed deck and probably a few too many gifts thrown in there, but here's the timeline I am attempting to uh, stick to. So first, we'll talk alignment and buy-in when it comes to marketing planning. I have some really nice stories of where things didn't go so well, so you can kind of learn from some of my mistakes there. And then we'll touch on positioning, but really how you drive growth through product value. And then we'll discuss some of the best distribution channels, and finally, we will wrap things up with identifying growth opportunities and some Q&A at the end. So first, getting buy-in. Something we have all been practicing, I think, since we were children, trying to convince our parents to invest in the latest game or toy. In business, I have found that getting buy-in from marketing plans, strategic initiatives, or investments isn't actually that different. But one thing that has worked is focusing on the market problem to get buy-in. What does that mean? Well, first, I wanted to take it back to an extremely basic level, which we are all more than familiar with, and touch on marketing planning. Now, everyone here knows what this involves. This is HubSpot's definition of it. I think it's a pretty good one. However, having done this for a few years now, I've revised it to be a bit more reflective of my experience. So I feel the real definition could be that marketing planning is the world's largest PowerPoint with an overstuffed appendix, slides you'll never ever get to on the call, 
and feedback from people you haven't even met and some you're not even sure if they work there. It's got more conflicting opinions than your family's Thanksgiving dinner, especially when that crazy uncle or VP shows up. Overstuffed appendix and turkey and Thanksgiving jokes aside, uh, there are definitely several basic key components, I think, of a successful plan that are worth highlighting. The first is always the goal. Like, what are you hoping to achieve here? Then you have the most likely suspect for too many slides, which is always the analysis. I've seen a lot more focus lately on competitive and usage, so always things to keep in mind. And for the meat of the deck, you'll want to be focusing on strategies and tactics, including the budget, which was a great question earlier, and associated channel spend, everyone's favorite part. How much is this actually going to cost us? Finally, key metrics are the last thing to include to make sure that what you're doing is measurable. Now, this all sounds great. It's still very, very basic, and we all know this, but I'm outlining it because in a few minutes, we'll get into agile and growth plans, something that deviates from this traditional framework just a bit. And I wanted to highlight this because it's still typically the foundation for lots of our strategic work in marketing. And I find myself coming back to it frequently when it's planning season and even when we're just thinking about smaller ideas. So a great plan means nothing without alignment. It's like spending all day cooking this turkey and then you realize you did not invite anyone. And I think like that's my limit on Thanksgiving jokes. Really, these should have been Halloween puns anyway, but I skipped a holiday. Great alignment means that you have identified all of your stakeholders and impacted audiences prior to that big call where you are presenting your plan. It means that you have buy-in ahead of time and the right people on your side so that you have credibility when it comes to asking for budget and prioritization. As you can see by this very sophisticated and scientific graph, I've begun to illustrate from previous roles in my career where some teams have landed on this very scientific scale. You'll get people who will literally just do whatever they want, and some people who may enjoy derailing an entire call over the size and color of your PowerPoint font. But in the end, most people want to help, and having their buy-in ahead of time will only make you look better. Now, the new season of Love is Blind just came out on Netflix, so red flags are really top of mind for many people right now, especially after those first two episodes. For alignment, I have highlighted a couple here. The first big one is sales, especially sales leaders learning about your plan after it has already been shipped, approved, and in the market. Oftentimes, sales are the only means of communication between the product and your customer. And without the buy-in from sales, chances are when it comes time to pitch, they're saying something completely different than what you spent countless hours putting together, resulting in an almost disjointed customer experience. You'll want their buy-in early and often so you, they can feel included in what is ultimately shipping out. And a good trick that I've learned is to get feedback and buy-in from some of the top reps, sales managers, or sales leaders who can later act as evangelists for your campaign to other sales reps. The next is functional teams. And I am talking about all of the amazing design, video, creative, and automation teams that we work with. I can literally picture meetings still at Cengage where I was running through just this laundry list of web, collateral, and video updates while I watched our four functional teams look on almost in horror. And to be clear, they were amazing, especially the, the designer. He was literally incredible but they should have had more input from me and they should have given the feedback I should have asked them up front to make my plans more actionable and really grounded in reality. And finally, if the VP of product is slacking you, asking you how you are promoting their huge launch that happened two weeks ago, let's just say you've probably missed something major. It is also worth noting though, that good alignment doesn't always equal hundreds of decision makers tons of opinions or tons of feedback sessions and improvers. Instead, it means that people feel like they've been involved at the right time and in the right way. If you aren't familiar, we use this DACY framework a lot at HubSpot and I actually really like it. So prior to a kickoff, we'll identify who that responsible person is, the driver, and who is the ultimate approver. A lot of times it'll be your boss or your boss's boss. And then we'll also say, who is contributing? Who are we going to be going to and asking for input? And finally, we'll have a group of people that are just going to be informed who we aren't necessarily even going to be seeking input from or seeking feedback from. 
This framework has helped a lot and brought lots of clarity while also cutting down on some of those feedback rounds. Speaking of feedback, uh, someone way smarter than me came up with this 30 and 60 and 90 day framework for feedback. Feel free to steal and use it. We sometimes do this at HubSpot and it helps guide those that are actually the ones giving the feedback, especially when we're close to the end to avoid getting feedback or comments that would maybe force us to do a major rewrite at the last minute. It's going to let your consulted and informed people know what level of feedback you are looking for so they're not wasting their time and you get the detail and the answers that you need. So I highly recommend this. To summarize this alignment section, uh, bad alignment and feedback can make for some pretty epic movies. Uh, bonus points here if anyone can name this classic, it's my dad's favorite movie, but can make for really poor strategic progress. All right. While not visually as appealing as the pretty awesome office space slide before us, I wanted to bring us back to goals for plans, what we originally touched on. Once you have that alignment, that feedback, you'll want to define some really solid goals and strategies. And something I think that HubSpot does really well when it comes to this area is really starting from the bottom. And by that, I'm not talking about Drake. I mean, starting close to the customer, specifically what we are going to solve for. Rather than coming up with a new feature or a new idea, a lot of times we'll start by talking with customers, uncovering pain points, and seeing what their challenges are in business. From there, and with all that insight, we'll start to work upwards as we shape our goals, our KPIs, and our metrics. Now, most places I think we've all worked have had like overarching corporate and strategic goals that we can ladder up to. But one thing I like to do where you can is really try and benchmark not only against some of your internal benchmarks, but also against industry standards. So look at things within your company, like what's the average open rate for this email compared to the rest of the company? How did I compare? But also look at growth within your industry and how those financials are performing compared to your peers. It's going to give you a much more realistic uh, forecast and outlook on how your goals are progressing. And finally, one bonus one. If you haven't heard of this, another great acronym uh, is to make SMART goals. I'm not going to get into a ton of detail, but it's a framework that someone else has developed. And the main TLDR here is that it will put some guardrails on your goals to make sure they are more impactful and actually mean something. So I mentioned this idea earlier of agile marketing and growth back when we were talking about that traditional marketing plan. This is a relatively new twist that I've seen become more popular. And it's this idea that rather than having this big formal marketing plan, you treat tactics and strategies like agile sprints. So experimenting, gathering insights and refining based on data. And a lot of this experimentation here doesn't necessarily mean constantly churning out new content, but rather it could be something as simple as tweaking channel spend, tweaking segmentation, or even altering the messaging until you get those highest results. And one cool thing that I've done in the past is to have almost like a parking lot of ideas and a roadmap for marketing, not just for products, where you can map out future tactics and ideas that you want to try and experiment on in the future. So I know transitioning to something like this and getting buy-in from leadership, especially those who have done marketing planning more traditionally, can be a little challenging. So what I like to do is, as we're going into campaign planning, try and think of certain areas, maybe just 10 20% of what you're doing or just five, 10% of your total spend and save that for experimentation. Think about how you can drive growth in new segments or new channels that you can explore. What ideas have you had that you really wanna test? Um, quick and agile sprints here can help you actually uncover what could be a future core channel segment or tactic in the future. And all it takes is just one experiment. So a good quick example of this from the past was from Cengage. So I got the chance to work with a really talented marketing manager who focused on awareness with an awesome agency as well. Cengage is a big ed tech company. The division that we worked in was higher education. So marketing focused on getting our products out in front of higher education students and professors. A lot of you, if you went to college, you've probably uh, given Cengage a chunk of change at some point in your life. One of the big challenge was finding the right channels though to engage with students, especially given the sheer amount of noise that they faced from brands. Additionally, we needed channels that would feel authentic to a textbook publisher, someone that many students didn't necessarily want to hear from in the first place. 
So a big part of this was knowing where our customers spent their time. We quickly saw digital channels like TikTok and Hulu and others rise to the top, but something that the team tried was engaging with students in some higher ed industry specific channels, including some really cool out of home, non-traditional ones. Think about things like move-in day on campus, sponsoring move-in carts to cart people's stuff into their dorm rooms, food trucks, on-campus activations, like brand activations. Online, that looked like ads in places like Her Campus and Rate My Professor, sites that had credibility and pull from our audience. Were professors thrilled that, you know, at one point we were advertising on a site where students could rate how attractive their professors were? Likely not. But... We saw great engagement as well as awareness boosts from some of these non-traditional challenges channels because we went where our customers spent time thanks to a lot of great research. So now it's time to talk about product value and positioning and some of the most basic important cornerstones of product marketing and strategy in general. So communicating value for your product really comes down to positioning. Positioning is like that classic activity that we've all heard of it seems really easy and we've all heard how to do it a million different times. But when it comes to actually putting the pen to paper and writing it, it can be harder than we ever imagined. April Dunford here, her book that just did a little bit of a spin, wrote a really, really brilliant book called Obviously Awesome Positioning. I cannot recommend it enough. Won't get into a ton of detail, but she breaks down some really practical step-by-step -step ways to deposition your competitors and set yourself apart. One really good point she makes is that positioning should almost be like context setting. You can have like the best product in the world, but without the right context, your customers will not know what to make of it. It's almost like it's this opening scene in a movie. So just like imagine if the movie Jaws didn't have that first iconic shark attack scene or if Drew Barrymore survived those first five minutes of the movie Scream right? The entire film would lack the foundation and context that that initial first few minutes built up. And if you think about it, positioning works in a very similar way. One of the things though, that I also learned through Reforge, which is a really great professional de development company, is to have a strategic emphasis in your positioning. This is the thing that you can identify and lean into as a differentiator to enable your product to su succeed and achieve growth in the market. So some of the examples would include a pain point based strategic emphasis where you lean into a specific problem or maybe an audience based one where you position the product for a specific underserved market. Two others that are a bit more rare in my opinion are first like differentiator based where your product is unlike anything else in the market and it can kind of speak for itself. And then finally change based positioning. And that's where your product is a thought leader guiding the market through a transformation. Think about things like the first Uber, Netflix, or Apple's iPhone. I found that going through that traditional positioning framework and then trying to anchor it on one of these key strategic emphasis points helps keep it more focused and in the end makes it more impactful when it's rolled out. All right, so switching to a video game reference. Obviously there are positioning pitfalls we can fall into here. And just like this classic game that I cannot even begin to date right now, they can range from mild to a pit full of hungry alligators. A big one is deciding positioning based on just intuition or stakeholder opinion and not without data. Now, when I say stakeholder opinion, I of course mean like whatever the VP of product or the VP or head of marketing has told you and not what you have carefully put together. What I have learned though, is that when you quickly give in and change based on the opinion of maybe one higher up, you're usually gonna open yourself up to more change from other higher ups and inevitably get this like vicious feedback cycle loop going. It's really easy, honestly, sometimes just to quickly fold and move on. But what a lot of leaders really respect, in my opinion, uh, which could be wrong, is someone who can really stand by their recommendations and based on the data, provide reasoning as to why that person's opinion might not always be the correct one or might not be in line with what the customer's needs actually are. Of course, if they have final veto or approval power, you should get on board, but not first without providing reasoning. Now, another big one that I've fallen into a lot and even recently is getting overwhelmed by research. Personas, use cases, customer needs are all things that are so important but depending on who you talk to, it can be a quick Google or a multi-year $100,000 research and effort, right? 
There's so much information out there and getting overwhelmed can be easy. But a trick is to really set time constraints and thresholds for how much data you're going to be looking at so you know when it's time to move on. Another one is not addressing the competition. April in her book discusses how you can deposition your competition, and I think it's a great move. Especially if your product lacks that top of mind awareness among consumers, ignoring your competition in your positioning puts you at risk for not standing out and getting lost in the sea of alternatives. Finally, not testing your messaging is a huge, huge one. And it's probably the biggest one on here. I cannot even count the number of customers, partners, and users we spoke to at HubSpot when we were updating our sales hub positioning. The insight that I actually got from them was some of the best, and it ranked higher than a lot of what I received internally. And because it came from our end user, it's ultimately respected by leadership because it's going to speak to the needs of the customer, right? All right, two quick positioning stories for you. Uh, any Cengage colleagues would likely be horrified by this outdated slide I pulled from Google, but that's what I found on Google. I'll set the scene for you. Uh, so Cengage, talked about it a bit, was your traditional college textbook publisher. We worked in the office and the market had not experienced a lot of disruption since the dawn of eBooks and online homework platforms. It was December and it was their annual sales meeting where all of marketing and sales got together to essentially show sales. Hey, here's all the awesome new products. Here's why you should be excited about it. And here's why you should be pumped to get out on campus in spring. I didn't get an invite to this one. Uh, it was like a few years ago, still a little salty about it. But one of my best friends from Sangage, Lauren was there and started texting me about this brand new product that they were launching. It was kept in like total secret and unveiled by the CEO with a dramatic live doodle, which is not like the dog. It looks cooler than it sounds. Picture like artists painting this like live painting as he's giving a speech. It's very, very cool. If you ever have the budget for it, like it looked great. Um, but what it was, was essentially the first subscription service for textbooks. Now, while unlimited textbooks might not sound like the most exciting thing to the average person, to our market, and financially sensitive college students, this would really land. Of course, you know, after the four days of the meeting, excitement tends to taper off a little bit. Some hangovers, both from information and other things set in. I think Lauren actually missed her flight. And reps were ready to pitch this brand new marketing leading concept on campus. What we didn't anticipate though, was some of the customer confusion. This was brand new. It was a brand new category, lots of freemiums, lots of product, and needed a lot of context setting to explain. Questions were endless, but there was still excitement. This was something that none of our competitors were doing. And when you think about it, the value proposition of saving money was right on for college students. But we needed the faculty and administrator buy-in. So we needed a buy-in from some of our other personas. And I'm not sure the last time you uh, went to college, but some faculty, to put it very nicely, are not extremely receptive to new technology. So the team needed to position this to faculty who had essentially the keys to the student purchase model because students would only purchase if required. Uh, and what we embarked on was lots of tweaks to the offering, to the messaging, to the purchase model, all based on feedback from customers and internal data. I think each tweak and each change bought the product that much closer to its ultimate desired state, deepened customer understanding, and showed that we were listening to the market. So the key takeaway here, I think, is that you shouldn't be afraid to refine and tweak your messaging or offering based on feedback even post-launch. Now, that's not saying that positioning can't be evergreen, but thoughtful changes and updates, I think can really help your product achieve long-term growth. The next one and kind of shorter example here is for Sales Hub. So this is a product at HubSpot. If I go and I ask a room full of people to name me a sales CRM or a sales software, most people are going to say the word Salesforce. Some will say Microsoft Dynamics, some will say HubSpot, but sales software, as I found from working in it, is a lot more complex than that. There's like the CRM, but then there's also prospecting software, data software, call recording, enablement, sourcing, and so much more. So in this market, trying to define the lanes and exactly which swim lanes your product plays in can quickly become very complex. And as someone who was new to the industry, it was even harder as I was trying to navigate how to position Sales Hub in particular and inform our future content updates that would come. So first, I turned to the DACI, the feedback rules, some of the planning tools from earlier. 
but needed research and customer opinions. The big thing here that worked was this mini listening and feedback tour I did with customers. So obviously I followed a lot of principles uh, from April Dumford's book and crafted sort of like this V1 of the positioning and messaging that we ran by customers. It was literally just a couple sentences. And based on feedback, we would revise and repeat it, eventually working our way into a full-blown pitch deck. Along the way, we made sure to include customers from all different industries, sizes, and geographic markets to make sure that what we were putting together would resonate with as many of our customers as possible. Without this customer feedback, we wouldn't have landed on what you see here, which is just pulled straight from our website, um, the core messaging and capabilities of Sales Hub. So if you take one thing away from this example, I would be that you should be listening to your customers as much as you can. All right, rounding the corner here to talk about distribution strategies. I know this is tons of info. So how do you get that great positioning and content out there? Well, first you have to get it out there internally. You might not have the budget for live doodlers, but you can still do a lot internally. The first is internal distribution. And it may seem simple, but just taking out that extra bit of effort and time to send that email or that Slack or Microsoft Teams update and keep people updated on what you have produced. If you have a smaller or a medium-sized org, I found that roadshows work really, really well, jumping in other team meetings and walking them through some of the updates and giving them that chance to ask questions has been really effective. Then all the way back to buying, and I won't repeat myself here, uh, if you know, you know with this arrow, uh, which team is going to be the hardest to get buy-in from, but which team can also be the most impactful. After all, sales is going to be interested only in what works for them, and rightfully so, because they're the ones selling the product and it's their salary that's dependent on it. So if you get their buy-in at the end, you will be golden. Externally though, and this is a great example, I are indeed, which is robbing and duplicating, Market segmentation is your first step in distribution. This is a fantastic chart that Sam Rush, which is a company like HubSpot uh, that produces lots of great thought leadership content created. I'm not gonna go into a lot of depth here, but you can see the different types of segmentation and areas that you can dive into. In the past, I've really leaned into behavioral and media segmentation as successful segments, but there are so many options out there for you to pick and choose from and craft unique customer populations. A Little bit of a 28 days later type visual, but if you aren't familiar, here's the process for choosing and creating some of those segments on the previous slide. You'll wanna start with market research and using some of those criteria, bundle them to create cohorts of people. We're literally doing this right now on our side. Then you can prioritize based on things like return, competition, customer needs, market size, and finally create some messaging and tactics and choose the right channels. All right, so here's a bonus point. Uh, it's called maturity models, not this kind of maturity, which is like getting eight hours of sleep. If anyone here has a newborn baby, it's impossible. Um, but it's instead this not as exciting maturity model. This is just an example for illustrative purposes, but really what it is, is differentiated messaging and features that you would pitch to customers depending on their sophistication. So for us at HubSpot, that means things like the size of the organization. What automation are they using? What tools are they already using? We wouldn't pitch a product to a small mom and pop bookstore in the same way that we would pitch that same product to a larger software company. Laying out a maturity model, I think can really help refine and drive specificity in your messaging, especially if you have tiered pricing for whatever product you're marketing. I find it really, really useful to lay out the different features, messages, and core benefits that each level of customer sophistication uh, will be engaging with. All right, I've touched on this a bit already, but here are some channels that have worked really, really well in the past. Um, just for me personally, LinkedIn and TikTok have been absolutely huge. Uh, partner marketing has worked really well, really well as well. At Cengage, this would look like things like a university or a learning management software company like Blackboard or Canvas. Um, and then another one that works really, really well is blogs. I think even in the advent of AI, people are turning to thought leadership and blogs and content before they even get close to that purchasing decision. So if you haven't already, 
SEMrush is incredible at it. And so is HubSpot. Uh, it's almost like a masterclass on how to build a great blog. So definitely check those out. Two other ones that are huge right now are short form video content. This can be from your employees, from customers, and even better from like advocates and influencers. Uh, we've got a really, really cool um, sales thought leadership webinar coming up in just a few weeks that we're running. And I'm so excited to see the results because I find that whenever we can lean into some of those thought leaders and those experts, even the ones that aren't using our products, we build a lot of credibility with our audience. All right. So key metrics for PMM can vary depending on your talking, who you are talking to that day. Uh, these are some of my favorites. Obviously, you have your standard marketing ones like traffic, conversion, marketing qualified leads, but I really want to encourage you to think beyond some of the typical PMM and product metrics and look at other things that not only marketing, but products as well, if you're in product, can influence when it comes to growth. Think about things like brand awareness, sentiment, and impressions as being great measures of how your customers are perceiving you before you even get to that demo or that sales call. Think about some of the things that you can do to influence those other areas of the business. And in turn, the other teams usually are really, really thrilled uh, that you're wanting to work with them. Retention is also, I think, a huge metric and topic right now, just given the economy and average customer spend, as well as time to close. Um, so things like customer churn, lifecycle value, and net promoter score are all things you should try and be plugged into to maximize the influence and impact that your campaigns and strategies are having across the organization. All right, to finally wrap it up, because I know this has been an explosion of information, um, finding up growth opportunities, only one or two more slides, I promise. So looking for those growth opportunities we keep talking about, here are some of the top ones that I found worked really, really well. First, your customers. Nothing else I can say here other than the importance of regular communication. The second is your sales team. Join some of those team meetings, listen to gong call recordings or any other call software you have, hear your messaging and see your product in action. It may not be what you expect. They may be talking about it in a completely different way, but the insights that you will get from watching and listening in on some of those actual pitches are really, really incredible. Finally, when it comes to your competition, like for us, you know, obvious competitors or other CRM players, so jump in on things like Dreamforce from Salesforce, pop in on some virtual sessions. Nothing wrong with seeing what other teams in your industry are doing. Check out their sites, their materials, and chances are you'll find something pretty, pretty cool. A big one too, if you are new to the industry, like me being newer to um, the sales and marketing software industry, are to follow some thought leaders on LinkedIn. Go and see some of your customers and look to see who are they following and who are they engaging with outside of your company to find out what you can learn from them as well. And then an easy one, virtual conferences, uh, no free swag or cheap boxed wine or light beer, I know, but getting to these has never been cheaper and easier before and I've found them to be great for networking. All right, in conclusion, so two slides here, I guess, I think I'm on time. Here are some of the top takeaways then to drive growth from this action-packed deck. First is to get that alignment, be diligent about your feedback and goals, yet be agile in planning. Experiment in marketing and avoid those pitfalls to lean into new segmentation because in the end, you will be able to find new growth areas in your industry and market segment. And that's it. I hope that was helpful and not too overwhelming with info. If you ever want to connect, feel free to add me on LinkedIn, send me a message. I am happy to talk all things products and customer marketing and HubSpot as well. Brilliant, Alex. And rife with pop culture references. You know I'm here for it. That was <laughs> fantastic. Um, my friend, we have questions uh, sprouting at the seams. I just made that metaphor up. I don't know what it means, but there's lots of questions. Good Are you ready to sit on the hot seat for a little bit here? I am ready. Folks, if you have a question you'd like me to toss over to Alex, stick it in the Q&A. And we've got a little time here, so we will get through as many as we possibly can. All righty. Let's start with, here is a great question from Rhonda. Rhonda says, uh, could you perhaps go back and explain a bit more about that 30, 60, 90 slide? We went through that quick. We've got some time. Can you drill down on that one a little for us, Alex? For sure. I will just give everyone um, flashing lights warning here as I find it. Yeah. 
So the 30, 30, 60, 90 days is as you're going, it's a great question. As you are creating this project or whatever you're doing, you start to lay out at which point would you like what level of feedback, right? So maybe when you've just drafted an initial strategy doc, you're more at like the 30% where you're saying, hey, you know, I would love to know if this is even the right direction to go in. Like, give, let me know, give me some insight. Like, is this even something worth pursuing? Versus like when you're at like that 60% stage, you've kind of made that decision that yes, we're going to do this. So now I need some more feedback that's like, you know, how is this looking? Is this the right language? Are we able to expand this concept in any way? And then finally, like the 90% I found is like that final gut check, you know, check spelling, make sure the brand identity is there and things like that, just to make sure um, it's good to go. But the big TLDR here is that you want to make sure anyone that you know is going to want to give you 30% feedback that you get to them at the beginning because you do not want to get to them at 90. There we go. Awesome. Thank you. That is very helpful. Here is a question from Chandy who says, what are some good industry sources for B2B marketing benchmarks? That is a really, really great question. Um, I would obviously plug things like G2, uh, Gartner, any of those industry peer review sites are phenomenal when it comes to seeing how your product is doing. Industry benchmarks, I would follow things like the Swipe Files, which is a brilliant newsletter someone does who is a PMM newsletter. Um, follow that for industry benchmarks as well. And then if you aren't sure in the right direction to go, I find that asking leadership for that information shows your interest and shows them that you're wanting to compare what you're doing to outside. And I feel like they're usually really, really helpful in finding uh, those. Good tip, good tip. Good for the career too. Um, I was curious, Alex, can you talk a little bit more about the process? Uh, you talked about changing messaging post-launch this sort of iterative process, but once it's already, you've already launched uh, and you're just sort of clarifying some things, uh, are, are there risks to that? What, what sort of guardrails should you put in place so that you're not confusing, say your early adopters that are like, yeah, we're all in. And then the messaging changes and they're like, wait, what? How, exactly. how do we avoid that scenario? It's a great question. And it's like a very, very tricky line to walk, right? Because in one side, you just spent, you know, big dollars, get videos, websites, collateral, everything updated with all this new messaging. But on the other hand, you want to make sure that it reflects any changes in the market, as well as any changes or insights that you didn't have before you launched it. So what I've found to do is set really clear guardrails around when you would make those updates. So it's not something that, okay, the first person that comes to you, we will tweak this we'll say, okay, three, four months from now, we'll revise this based on market feedback. Once we revise it, here are the different things we're gonna update. Here are the things we're gonna leave with some of the slightly older positioning. That way we're not just constantly in this frantic cycle of revise, revise, revise. Obviously even at HubSpot, think about all the incredible like AI innovation that you see everywhere. This is probably the first presentation that someone didn't say the word AI in until now. Oh, um, that's, uh, that's question three. We haven't gotten to it yet. Oh, perfect. It's coming. <laughs> um, so even things like that, like we're constantly having to adjust based on just the rapid evolution of technology, but setting guardrails and timelines for those adjustments is very helpful. Awesome. Good. And then, so like if you do end up having to make not, not just an addition, but an actual change to the messaging, maybe you're changing some stipulation of membership, whatever, uh, you know, do you, do you then have to make a big mea culpa? Do you acknowledge, look guys, we tried this, it didn't work. Or do you just kind of glide on through and say, this is what it is now. What better, better approach there. Yeah. I think, um, a really good analogy can be, if you think about when your company goes through a rebranding, right. And the branding team says, these are the new logos, the new colors, the new fonts, likely they're going to come to you and say, you know, help us help you prioritize what to update. Here's the reasoning why we did it. Uh, and here's why it's impactful to have it going forward. So I think it's worth communicating and acknowledging what drove the change. Uh, but at the same time, I think it's worth being realistic with people in terms of updates and go forward strategy for new content. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, AI question. Are you ready? I'm ready. Uh, we uh, from Tara, how are companies like HubSpot utilizing AI to help with strategic marketing? That's a phenomenal question. I would definitely um, check out HubSpot.com's AI page. There's amazing tools from like campaign and content assistant that our customers are using uh, to really like speed up a lot of their content generation. 
from a strategic point of view, I can't speak to what the whole company's doing, but I can say for myself, um, I try to work it into uh, messaging refinement. I try to work it into, you know, even small things like communications I'm going to send out. We have like a lot of companies now have their own kind of versions of chat GPT. Um, so I like to kind of use that as like a someone to bounce something off of. Um, but yeah, from a broader strategic point of view, I think that would definitely be an amazing question for HubSpot's leadership team. Yeah, cool. That is the topic of the day. Um, here's a here's a sort of a, a cultural problem. It sounds like this attendee has. Uh, my company struggles with stakeholders giving buy-in early on. Then after launch, they no longer are on board and will sometimes even tell salespeople that they don't have to follow the plan because they personally didn't like it. Have you experienced anything like this? How do you overcome that problem? Early buy-in and then apathy. That's awkward. It is, it is, it is awkward. And I think typically when you're looking at that, yes, it's going to be uh, the sales team. I actually worked with a sales rep once who never installed Slack. They did not, like the whole company was oh. Slack. They just didn't like Slack. They refused oh, to. Oh, wow. <laughs> it missed a lot of great information. Uh, but one of the things that I found is like, if you get that initial leadership buy-in from like the SVP, RVP, director of sales, whoever, whomever, if you get that initial buy-in, ask them for champions or, you know, internal people in sales who are looked to not as a manager of people, but as a leader amongst their colleagues, and then go and leverage them prior to launch and post-launch to actually show how they're using the tools, get them to show their colleagues and things like that. So bringing as many salespeople along as possible um, is something I definitely recommend. When we would do big presentations and trainings on new topics, almost every single time I would have at least one, two, three, four sales reps actually presenting some of it with me to build that instant peer credibility. So I would say, get the initial approval from leadership and then work your way all the way to the bottom um, to sales reps and get their buy-in. There you go. Brilliant. Hopefully that helps. Um, here is a question about influencers. Philip says, do you have any tips on how to identify the right influencers for a go-to-market strategy within B2B? Uh, Philip says, I can't always get a Kardashian to speak about my products for me. So, so I don't know what's wrong with you, Philip. I have like five Kardashians talking about my products at any <laughs> given moment, but, uh, yeah, if we don't, if we aren't that lucky, how do we identify not just influencers, but the right influencers? First of all, maybe what makes a good influencer and then how do we, how do we access them? It's such, it's such a great topic. And like, I, there's so many smart people in this area that know a lot more than me, but I think from like the Kardashian side of things. Not many companies, right, can afford a Kardashian size thing. Um, we just had inbound our big conference. Reese Witherspoon was the headliner. She's wow. phenomenal. Derek Jeter as well. Oh. Um, but if you're talking about like a product, product marketing or just a product-led thought leadership influencer, one of the best places I've found to identify them is on LinkedIn. Uh, they have these little badges now. And I think it's called like top voice in the area. So search the hashtags that you're looking for. Like if you're saying, okay, sales engagement software is my product look that up on LinkedIn and see what the top thought leaders are talking about. And then the one thing I recommend for finding like really the right person, go back through their posts and make sure their content is somewhat in line with your company's values, your mm. tone of voice and things like that, because you want to make sure you have a really, really good match. Um, and some people love to work with you for free. Some people charge money, but I think going through LinkedIn, searching the topic areas, and then just reaching out to the person like, uh, every, lots, most people love like talking, like here I am just talking. So that would be my, my recommendation. Good, good stuff there. Um, here is another one, uh, could, from Chandy. Could you share some good sources for finding the latest B2B marketing benchmarking data and competitor spends? What, uh, good sources might you recommend there, Alex? That's an amazing one. Um, can I follow up after the call? Because there is a website where you can go and plug in your competitors, see their actual ads. And I think it gives you some idea of that. And I'd rather than just give you um, something made up, I'd rather give you the actual website because that is Perfect. where I've gone before. Perfect. Uh, in fact, what we do, uh, everybody who's registered today will get a copy of the of the presentation so we can send out any any resources that you happen to think of between now and then in a, in an attachment to that as well. So we will send that uh, in due time. Um, let's do this one. Do you have any suggestions for the best way to put positioning in front of prospects? 
best ways to put the positioning in front of the prospects? That's a tough, it's, that's a tough one because it's a big one. I know (laughs) because you're essentially going to people that you're ultimately trying to convince to buy your product with untested messaging and asking for their honest feedback. Um, One thing that we've done is like whatever sales software you use, you know, HubSpot's great has different deal stages likely, right? And so you have an idea of who are your customers that you lost the deal. You know what I mean? What deals are still open that have been open forever? Who's been sitting in the prospecting stage for, you know, or the new lead stage for X amount of days, right? I would recommend just as long as you're with the CSM or the sales rep, just reaching out to those customers, you know, offering like a $20 gift card, framing it as like a research opportunity, not a sales pitch. And a lot of times people will jump on. Um, I talked to a decent amount of non-customers for sales hubs positioning. A lot of people who use like Salesforce, Zoho, other things. And they gave me some really, really great and honest feedback. Um, I think the thing to remember is like, people aren't going to be like haters. This is just software for the most part. And, you know, most people are generally really, really gracious with their feedback. So I would just recommend finding those people in your CRM, reaching out to them and just having an informal chat. Brilliant. Good. Uh, great question here from Mitchell. Uh, are the content suggestions uh, for places like Instagram and Facebook and TikTok, are those working in the the B2B realm or do those mostly just work out in B2C? Is that, is that what do you think? That's a really, really good question. Um, it just depends on what your company's content strategy is, as well as what they're looking to achieve as far as like a thought leader in the space, right? So If you go on HubSpot's Instagram right now, um, there's some pretty funny videos of like, you know, cool office culture. And then if you go to Duolingo, which is a B2C company, they have an amazing social campaign involving a stuffed owl uh, that is just like walking around everywhere. It's the greatest thing ever. So I think from a B2B perspective, as long as that direct line of communication um, is something that is prioritized, it works for both ways, right? Instagram works great for B2B. LinkedIn works phenomenal for B2B. And especially for like our audience is like marketers, salespeople, service thought leaders. Um, People are engaging in those channels for content on what we are producing. So those have really worked really well. I think influencers is a really, really good one because um, people pay a lot of attention and a lot of money at conferences to see sales and marketing and thought leaders speak. And same thing goes for B2C. So I think it works both ways as long as it's in line with your company's strategic goals and tone of voice. Interesting. And uh, are those users these days blending their personal lives and their business lives on the same platform? Like your your ad for your software product is going to come up right next to the post from their mother laughing at their silly thing their dog did. It's it's just all going to be mixed up in there, yes. right? Uh, exactly. I think I was scrolling through my Instagram reels and saw something from the Pragmatic Institutes earlier, right below. Something Indeed, related. you might have. Yes. Unrelated. So good job there. Um, I would say people nowadays with work from home and just how things have been going after COVID totally have. Interesting. Now, why why are those uh, social media channels so successful? Why, is that is that just... Is it just our default? Let's put something on TikTok. Let's put something on Facebook. Is that just because everybody's using it? Why are they so powerful at reaching people? Um, and then follow up to that. If your company does decide to utilize them, um, how do you figure out which one your potential customers live on? Because they are different crowds, as you know. For sure. Um, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to work with an agency, a lot of times they will handle all of that for you. But I think finding the reason that the channel social channels are powerful, not all of them are created equal. I think you have to look at like media studies and see where your prospects are spending their time. Where are they going to get their information? A lot of it comes back to inbound marketing and this idea of your customers almost going through this journey on their own before they even raise their hand or reach you. So if you're able to follow that journey and see the different channels they're engaging with, that'll help you find the most effective ones. And then as far as like balancing spend and things like that, it's definitely a lot more than like, let's put something on TikTok just for fun. Like I put something on TikTok, it's probably not going to do that well. Um, It's the having the right amount of boosting spend, the right amount of paid promotion, the right balance between organic and paid social um, and hitting like that almost sweet spot. And the only way you're going to get there is through experimentation uh, with those different channels. Yeah. Good. How about a question about KPIs? Um, what are some smart KPIs you use to track and measure product marketing performance? 
uh, separate from demand gen or go-to-market performance. Any, any other suggestions on good KPIs you use to track product marketing performance? That's a really, really good question. Um, it's easy to separate the KPIs for product marketing from demand gen. That's easy. Um, it's harder in my mind to separate the KPIs for product marketing from go-to-market strategy mm. just because of how integrated they are. I think you'll be looking at things like big things, obviously, that most companies are looking at are revenue, um, time from uh, MQL to SQL, and then time from a sales qual marketing qualified lead to a sales qualified lead, time from a sales qualified lead to a deal, and that sort of thing. And where people are dropping off at the different stages in the deal journey, I think those are all things that product marketing needs to have like very big tie into, right? Because a lot of organizations are very revenue driven. Um, so that's one area I think for product marketing, another one would be, um, just your traditional, like marketing metrics, especially where any of the positioning, the messaging and things like that live. Um, we'll look at things like, you know, in Gong, which is the sales software that records calls, you can search and see how often certain terms are being said, right? So if we launch a new feature called like, you know, X, Y, Z feature, I can go and I can see week over week, how that's trending amongst our sales team. So I think sales adoption is probably a good product marketing one to measure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. We love you, sales team. Um, Alex, here is a great one from Zillion. Uh, says, thank you so much for the presentation. What are some of the tactics or hacks that you use to drive stakeholder alignment, especially between PMM and the PM? Hacks to drive stakeholder alignment between those two parties. Stakeholder alignment is great. Sheila and I actually used to work together. Um, oh, fun. But stakeholder alignment is a really, really tough one. Between PMM and product, I see PMM as the bridge and the link between sales and product, right? So I think a lot of times what makes a great relationship is being the one to be able to bring that like front of market sales and customer feedback from the front lines back to product in a way that they can digest and action on. And then it's also being able to do the opposite take all of the exciting features and things that product is launching and bring them to market and to the sales team and get that sales buy-in. So one of the best ways to drive alignment um, for product, I think is having the strong relationship with the sales team and your, I think like ear to the ground or boots, whatever it means where you're like in front of customers and being that sort of like expert between the two. Is we call the it Nahito visits here, Alex. That's what that's called. Nahito okay. visits. Nahito visits. I will, I'll go with that. <laughs> Um, we are just about there. Hey, let's wrap up with a uh, book recommendation time. Uh, this question from Suba, I'm on the technical side. Could you recommend a book for understanding marketing and sales? Alex, your favorite marketing and sales techniques book recommendation. I, that is an amazing question. Um, I am, to be honest, not a big reader <laughs> product. The April Dunford book is incredible. Um, I'm trying to think of a good sales sales book. Let me follow up with you on that one. I will Good. check with one of my colleagues who is a brilliant uh, reader of books. Rather than there we go. Good. Book recommendation coming along with the other extra, extra resources. Books. They are on their way. Alex, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, and you mentioned it briefly, but just in case it, there were tons of questions that we just didn't have time to get to today. If folks wanted to reach out to you, you gave uh, contact info earlier on. Could you reprise that, please? I will. I'm just flipping back to the end here for you. I realized we were just chilling on a random slide. Um, yes, my contact information, you can reach me at a Rainford, my A, and then my last name at hubspot.com. You can also add me on LinkedIn um, and feel free to send me a message about anything product marketing, anything marketing or anything HubSpot. Uh, happy to talk. Brilliant. Gang, let me quickly plug the next in our product chat series. Uh, you're going to join us next time, October 26th, 1 p.m. Eastern time, when we will welcome product leader at Dropbox, David Tang, for a conversation on how AI and data insights can help you build stronger personas. See, Alex, AI came up again. It's not going to go away. It's not going away, folks. Alex, you have made us smarter, just as I predicted at the beginning. Thank you so much for being here and sharing all your info with us today. Of course. Thank you so much. It was great to be here with everyone. Uh, I hope you learned something. I'll follow up with a couple book recommendations. And yeah, I'll be jumping on this Dropbox session as well.
Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming today and for your questions. We will see you again next time. Thanks, everyone.